introduce yourself? Yeah, I figure I'll introduce myself. So for those of you who don't know me, um, I'm Jared Burns. I'm a, a postdoctoral fellow here at the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis. Um, before here, I was at UCSB working for the Santa Barbara Coastal LTER. I uh, got my PhD at UC Davis. I'm sorry, I'm totally you good have, you're correct. Am I good? Am I good? <laughs> <laughs> I've been around before that, hanging out with some, some crazy people there. Um, and I'm going to turn this off until I need it so we don't get that awful sound. Um, so today I'm going to be talking to you about some recent adventures that I've been taking into the world of crowdfunding and science crowdfunding. And I'm going to talk to you about this thing called the SciFund Challenge, um, of which you just saw one uh, example of a, a product coming out of it. And I'm going to talk about how engagement by us, by scientists, leads to crowdfunded science. Um, and before I go into this, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my major collaborator on this, Jai uh, Ranganathan, a center associate. Um, this, this project is really uh, the brainchild of both of us. This is both of us after we just launched the first round of SciFund Challenge. It's been a really exciting collaboration um, as we've kind of smashed our brains together and come up with something that's a kind of a weird love child of our minds. It's, it's uh, been interesting. Uh, so, science crowdfunding. Uh, what is it? Why is it? Why am I even standing up here talking to you about crowdfunding in science? Uh, well, really, this story begins with a confluence of a couple of different things that are, are going on in science and society today. Um, the first is something that I think we're all acutely aware of as scientists, and that is that um, science funding rates are declining. Uh, rates of funding of individual projects by individual labs or researchers are, are on the downswing. Um, so shown here, we've got the fiscal year plotted by funding success rate for NIH and NSF. Uh, you can see on average there's a downward trend for both of them. Um, there is this little bloop, uh, but that's the stimulus bill coming through. So while that, that kind of kicked things up for a while, it didn't obscure the sort of long-term trend that if you go and submit a grant, your probability of being successful is lower now than it was, say, back in 2002. So we have this in, on the one hand. Um, we also have something else going on, more on the society side, the interface between science and society. And that is that uh, public science literacy needs some work. So shown here we have uh, the results of a Gallup poll asking uh, whether or not you think that global warming or, or climate change and how scientists talk about it is generally exaggerated or not. And you can see that over time people think that we're exaggerating more and more. So even though we've accumulated more information, more evidence, people think we're exaggerating things more and more. So science literacy clearly needs some work. Um, one way to think about science literacy and one way to address it is scientists actually going out and doing outreach. Yet, within the academy itself, our attitudes towards outreach are not so good. So here's just a, a, a little bit from a recent paper. It came out actually just a couple of days ago. But it's one of the first real surveys of scientists' attitudes towards outreach and engagement. And it is depressing. Um, so in scientists' own words, science outreach is a bleak prospect with limited room for improvement. 74% of respondents list one or more significant impediments to their ability to do science outreach, yet less than half have concrete ideas for how science outreach can be improved. So it's bleak and we have no idea what we're doing. Um, <laughs> at the same time, also from this, uh, this same survey, we find that there appears to be across the board little reward structure for outreach. Um, so again, quoting from Eklund as all his work, and, and again, Fantastic paper, take a look at it. Scientists also perceive they're rewarded little for science outreach work, especially in the tenure process. So there's this, this sort of academic, or sorry, this, this cultural or institution barrier, institutional barrier to doing outreach and getting us out to the public. This is something that maybe people in this room don't feel as acutely as we're, we're lucky enough to have people like Nancy here, and, and we're all very uh, well trained and well aware of the importance of outreach, but. Uh, Outside of, of the hallowed halls of NCs, this is a real problem. So we have declining funding, we have a, a science literacy problem, we have these uh, not so great attitudes about outreach within the walls of the academy itself, and yet there are some cracks, there are some, some rays of light shining through. Uh, and the ray of light that, that Jai and I in particular have been very intrigued by is the fact that science communication is exploding online. So here are two quick screenshots from two sites, Science Seeker, which is just a constantly updated list of what science blog has updated itself most recently, and it's huge. 
um, you know, the Scientific American itself also hosts a number of scientists who are blogging about their work. So blogs, sort of this long-form online science discussion is exploding, particularly with earlier career scientists. And we also have tools like Twitter, uh, where again, this sort of ray of light of, of hope is coming through, where you have science communication exploding. Uh, you have uh, sites like Science Pond, which is collect all of the scientists who've been opening up their Twitter accounts online. Or on the other side, I, I have a list, uh, for those of you who are interested, of all of the ecologists, evolutionary biologists, and marine biologists that I've been trying to kind of collect together on Twitter. And I put together a list, and there are over 300 scientists on there. So there's this ray of light that's kind of shining through this outreach problem, shining through this, this funding problem, maybe. I mean, how does this ray of light illuminate? What, what does this ray of light illuminate that could be a solution to outreach funding um, and literacy? Well, what this ray of light really illuminates is RoboCop. Um, <laughs> he's there. He's there to protect you. He's there to protect us. And in particular, RoboCop comes to the center of the story when you think about statues of RoboCop. And that's about a year or so ago, uh, one man sent out to try and get a statue of RoboCop funded and then built for the city of Detroit, the sort of shining emblem of, of all that Detroit could stand for, of all that is good. Uh, and you'll notice in looking at this page uh, where he, he actually went out and used the internet and a crowdfunding site to actively solicit donations, uh, he achieved 167% of his goal, trying to re raise 50,000 and got 67,000. So compare the sort of 17% NIH funding rates to 167%. Not only that, but he had over 2,000 backers, almost 3,000. So huge reach. This project generated an enormous amount of reach. So RoboCop, it's where it's at. It, it shows us that there's this thing, this crowdfunding, that's, that can be enormously powerful in raising awareness and in raising funds. So today I'm going to be talking to you about crowdfunding, and in particular about how crowdfunding may apply to science. I'm going to start off just with an introduction of what is crowdfunding, for those of you who aren't familiar with it. Uh, I'm going to talk about outreach and engagement, because they really are the keys to the crowdfunding kingdom. Uh, and at least that's what I think we've, we've seen so far from other disciplines. Um, I'm going to talk about the SciFund Challenge in particular as an effort to take a look at whether or not engagement and outreach really are the keys to that science crowdfunding kingdom. And I'm going to end with some lessons and benefits of engaging via crowdfunding. So let's start off with, what is crowdfunding? Uh, so I'll throw up a simple definition for you. So what is crowdfunding? Well, crowdfunding is the solicitation of small donations from a large number of people for specific targeted projects. So small donations, large number of people, and specific projects. We're not talking about funding a program. We're not talking about funding something uh, huge and amorphous. We're talking about specific things. Uh, let's take a look at RoboCop again, and I'd like to walk you through kind of an anatomy of the typical sort of crowdfunding proposal that you will see online at a variety of sites. So we have this thing here, Detroit needs a statue of RoboCop, and this proposal is composed of a number of elements. Um, first is a goal. I mentioned this project was shooting for $50,000. So there's a goal, and that gives anyone who's funding this project a sense of accomplishment. They're helping you move towards something. There's no open fuzzy end. It's, you know, this is what I need. Let's get to 100%. There's a time limit. So I took this screenshot after the project was over, but that time limit gives a sense of urgency. I need to hit 100%, and I need to hit it now. So again, it's another way of involving people in your project. Uh, third, a proposal, uh, really where clarity is key. So obviously, you've got a nice, long, written space to talk about what you're doing. But it's got to be something that is clear, that appeals to a wide variety of people, that makes people really want to fund your project. Uh, a video. A video is not required, but uh, it creates a great deal of accessibility. We're a media culture. Uh, video is a really easy way to connect with people, to tell your story. Uh, and lastly, rewards. And rewards are something that people don't often think of when they start thinking about crowdfunding. But many crowdfunding proposals uh, revolve around having rewards. Uh, I heard someone once describe crowdfunding as a way to sell a lot of t-shirts for a good cause. And there's some truth in that. Typically, crowdfunding proposals have a number of different tiers of rewards where if you donate to a, promote, a, a proposal or to a project, you get something back. Uh, the key to this really isn't um, 
the key to this isn't the item itself in many ways. The key to this is that it makes you, the funder, feel engaged with the project. That you have been given something that makes you a part of this larger project. So those are the basics of a crowdfunding proposal. Uh, these proposals are, are typically posted on some sort of a website. And you may wonder, well, maybe this kind of RoboCop thing that's kind of a fluke, it's RoboCop, it's media, it's fun. Um, crowdfunding's huge. So this is a report from crowdsourcing.org. Uh, in, in 2011, over $1.5 billion was raised by a crowdfunding for different projects. It's, it's really exploding. The growth is just going up. Um, in North America alone, $837 million, roughly. Big source of funds. There's a, a vast array of different crowdfunding websites out there. A lot of people are trying to get in on this. Uh, it's a huge universe. Many of these sites have very targeted purposes. Some of them are more general. Um, there are a few dominant platforms. You may have heard of Kiva, which is more on the uh, a loan side. Um, but Kiva as a micro-loan service is really one of the things that brought this to the public's attention. Um, Kickstarter, Rocket Hub, with which whom we partnered, and Indiegogo are kind of three of the biggest uh, sites going right now in the US. Um, and these sites bring in, again, a great deal of money. It's estimated that arts crowdfunding from Kickstarter is actually greater for individual projects than you can get from the NEA. So the, the total amount of money flowing into the arts through Kickstarter and these other crowdfunding platforms outstrips the NEA. So again, big source of funds for disciplines that are able to effectively tap it. Um, there are many crowdfunding sites just for science. Um, Cancer Research UK, big one in the UK for funding cancer research. Petri dish, microrhizos, side flies. Again, growing industry. A lot of different sites, some of which can cater to you in particular. So a lot of options open for people that want to use crowdfunding. So okay, that's that's kind of our, our overview of the general crowdfunding website, or sorry, landscape. Uh, you have a project, you have a lot of places you can post that project. And if you do it right, there's really the possibility of bringing a good deal of, of funds into your project. So what do I mean by doing it right? What are the keys to this crowdfunding kingdom, and, and how is this applicable to science? So I'm going to argue that this is all about engagement and outreach. And I'm going to argue that by looking at one proposal in particular. So this is a project that's actually still live. Uh, this, if you're really interested in Amanda Palmer, if you listen to the Dresden Dolls like I did in Lincoln College, um, She's funding one of her albums, uh, a, a new record, art book, and a tour. And she's funding it through Kickstarter. And if you look at this, you see she's raised, when I took this screenshot a couple of days ago, uh, $670,000 from 12,000 people. And she has this, this video posted here, which really headlines uh, her thoughts that this is the future of music, that this crowdfunding model is the future of music. So if you look at Amanda Palmer's uh, piece, it, is this the future of music? And can we take her thoughts about the future of music and translate it to science? Um, so Zen Fox, uh, a participant in SciFund and, and a collaborator actually on, on some of this project, took this idea and said, well, is this the future of science? So is this the future? Is crowdfunding possibly one of the elements of the future of science? What can we learn from Amanda Palmer about uh, how she was able to successfully use crowdfunding to get such a, a large pool of money? And is that the future of science? So how did Palmer do it? Well, there are really two things that contribute to her success. One, she's got a huge discography. She's been around for a long time, doing uh, a lot of great music, putting together a lot of different collaborations, a lot of multimedia. She's someone who has a very large artistic audience. She has a fan base. She has a following. And she's done that by putting out great content, by engaging with an audience. And that great content has translated into a huge audience. Uh, she's someone that engages actively uh, in social media. And in social media, you can begin to see the size of her following. So this is uh, from Twitter. You can see on Twitter, she has half a million followers. So this is someone who, by engaging with an audience, has built up a huge fan base. And that huge fan base is translated into funding. So there's an element here of engagement that Palmer is so successful because she creates the audience for her work. And this is not limited to Amanda Palmer. We can look at George Takei, Sulu from Star Trek, right? Everybody knows Sulu. Uh, he was able to raise $150,000, or nearly $160,000, for a musical about Japanese internment camps. Uh, he was able to leverage his popularity 
and Leverage has sort of come back in the social media world in the last couple of years to raise a huge amount of money for a great artistic endeavor. It's not just limited to celebrity, though. It's not just limited to people that reach out to their audiences uh, as a celebrity. If you are able to create an audience through a product, you can also leverage this for money. So here we have a, a project, one of the sort of recent successes of crowdfunding, the Pebble e-paper watch. They've raised $10 million. Well, how do they do it? What is the e-paper watch? Why would people actually donate to this project? Well, the e-paper watch is something that interfaces with your iPhone. A lot of people have an iPhone. People are like, hey, I want something that makes my iPhone work better, that makes things uh, really work for me. This is an established company. They've done something like this before with um, Palm Pilots. And now they're saying, let's, let's go to the next place. Let's go to the next product that people love, their iPhones, and let's build off of that pre-existing audience base to raise money. So again, building an audience was crucial to funding this project at such a high level. <clears throat> it takes time to crowdfund a discipline. I've talked about a couple of examples of building an audience, but if we look at the history of any discipline, you can kind of see this constant pattern. Um, that ties into this idea of building an audience for crowdfunding to work. So here we can look at the arts. Um, this is an infographic um, from the New York Times recently. Uh, you have time kind of going up, and then you have levels of funding. Uh, and what you can see is that initially, down at the very bottom of the graph, in 2009, you weren't getting very much money coming in through arts crowdfunding. That it took a long time, three years, until audiences has been, had been built up and acculturated to the process of using crowdfunding before those big... Uh, Fifty to hundred thousand dollar grants would come through via crowdfunding. Uh, we see the same thing if you look at game development. Again, games have been trying to crowdfund themselves since early on. Two thousand nine is when again this started out. Um, not so much money coming in initially. It wasn't until quite recently that millions of dollars became possible in the gaming industry via crowdfunding. Again, an audience had to be built up, acculturated, and gotten used to the idea of crowdfunding. Not only that, but if you look at those, really, those multi-million dollar projects, you see kind of a commonality between them. Um, one of them is a follow-up to a classic role-playing game. Another is a sequel. Um, sorry, and another is a sequel. So we have uh, projects funding themselves based on an audience that's already built in yet again. So kind of, again, that Amanda Palmer, George Decay model. Um, there's a built-in audience for this. So it takes time to build an audience. And once you start putting up projects that have an audience, you're also able to do it. It's not an overnight process. Similarly, again, we can just go and look at design again. It took years, a couple of years of working on this to get it right, to build up an audience that's, that's used to and willing to crowdfund things. Um, and again, the projects that seem to be doing the best currently are those that leverage things like iPhones, um, iPads, or again, uh, the Pebble, which also looks at iPhones. So again, products for which there is already a pre-existing audience. Audience building, all about audience building. Um, so again, the paper. <clears throat> is this possible for science? Yes. So let's look at Cancer Research UK. Cancer Research UK is actually an older organization. It's been running for quite some time and now has this crowdfunded project site. So shown here, I've got a little histogram uh, that was generated just from looking at all of the projects that were posted on their website during one day. And what you can see is that while there are a lot of projects that are funded at the sub-25,000 uh, pound level, that's thousands of pounds, um, there are projects on up into greater than 100,000 pounds that are being funded by this organization or through this organization's crowdfunding portal. Well, why is that? That's because Cancer Research UK is an established organization and it's an organization with a long history of outreach. In its current incarnation, it, it has a much larger reach than just doing these online social projects. It's a, it's a large, it's a charitable organization. It's built its model around doing outreach, and it's able to leverage that in the crowdfunding arena. So we see that even within science, if you're working with an organization that has a long history of doing outreach, you are able to leverage these large numbers of fun, or large amounts of funds. This is for cancer, though, and, and you may be wondering, well, ecologists like us, um, people working in other disciplines, can we make this work as well? Um, you know, I'd argue if we look at all of these other disciplines, if we compare Amanda Palmer to, to Zen, it's, it's not quite the apt comparison if we want to think about the future of science. Uh, if you want to think about what is the future of science that could crowdfund itself um, successfully, really you want, to, you want to replace Zen there with someone like Neil deGrasse Tyson. 
Um, someone who is an excellent science communicator, someone who does excellent science outreach. By creating um, a public image for yourself and an audience, that's really what uh, will potentially enable you to leverage large amounts of funds. So this is again just talking about sort of the large amounts of funds model. Um, you know, doing this sort of outreach is something that, again, going back to the second paper, may potentially be antithetical to some scientists in the current culture in which we exist. Like I said, we are in a, a fantastic place here where this isn't how we think, but outside of, of NCs and, and organizations like us, we have, again, quotes like, this is a direct quote from one of the scientists in the survey. I'm not sure you want most of the people that I know here to go out and try to talk to the public. Uh, they're going to say, stop spending my tax dollars on this person. <laughs> And yet, despite this sentiment, only two respondents suggested training scientists as a way to remedy the situation and to be better <coughs> communicators. So it's not in our culture. Um, and in fact, we often think that we're starting at ground zero. So this is, again, this is a quote from another scientist who said, when somebody doesn't believe what you're doing is true or has any value, then trying to explain to them what you're doing, you're starting from this cultural foundation that is a complete disconnect. So many feel that we're starting at ground zero, that culturally we don't have this built into our DNA. And in fact, if, uh, many of the scientists we talked to early on thought, well, okay, maybe outreach is one way, but if we're even just doing the work of putting together a crowdfunding proposal, of course it will get funded. It's science. It's great. We didn't necessarily view outreach as an important component to successful crowdfunding. <coughs> So there are kind of two ways uh, that early on we thought that crowdfunding may end up working for science. Um, there's the engagement is key model, the sort of, well, let's build scientists, let's build their outreach capacities, let's, let's go this sort of um, outreach route. And there's this field of dreams idea. If you build it, they will come. If scientists try and crowdfund their research, our research is so cool that, of course, people will fund it. So these are the two different ideas about how crowdfunding might work about science. Um, obviously, I've presented some evidence for what I think is going to be the right answer. But Jai and I were both really curious, like, oh, hey, we've got all this online stuff going. Maybe the time's right to try this crowdfunding out. Which of these models will win? So we created the SciFund Challenge. Um, the SciFund Challenge we, is an experiment, we kind of created this experiment in crowdfunding to ask, can scientists use crowdfunding to communicate their science? and to raise money for research. Now, of course, our secret agenda behind this was the point is not just the cash, but the engagement. To get scientists out there to create a crowdfunding proposal, to try and get them to start engaging the public, to try and get them to start talking about their research in an accessible way. And we also wanted to know what, what works, what doesn't work. We had no idea. We'd never done this before. Neither John nor I had tried crowdfunding. Um, we had no clue. So experiments. It gets science to engage, and we had no idea what we were doing in the grand tradition of science. <laughs> um, so round one of SciFund Challenge, uh, here are some of the breakdowns of details. We used, uh, or sorry, not used, we worked with. Um, <laughs> well, I guess I'm one of the scientists, so I used myself. You can kind of take that as you will. Uh, 49 different scientists uh, trying to crowdfund their science. Actually, we were really impressed. Our initial um, effort to bring scientists into this yielded 250 people who wanted to try it out. And then once we kind of confronted them with what you would need to do to put together a crowdfunding proposal that dropped down to 49. Um, fair enough. It, it's a lot of work and it's very different than what we're used to doing as scientists. Uh, we ran this uh, from November 1st to December 15th, or at least that's the period that proposals were open uh, to the public. There was a, a great deal of groundwork we laid before that, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, so how much? The median ask from an individual scientist in round one was about $3,500, but proposals ranged anywhere from $500 to $20,000. So we had a big range. Um, big question of can you crowdfund something at a large level from the very beginning, or do you need to start small? All projects were hosted on Rocket Hub, which is a, a great crowdfunding site. We've had a, a really good time working with these guys. So, uh, 49 scientists, who is SciFund? I wanted to take a quick break in the talk and kind of um, give you a sense of who is SciFund. Um, who is SciFund round two, but I think it, it, it'll give you a sense of who SciFund is in round one as well. So let's bring this up. Hi, my name is 
name is Alyssa Gaiman, and I am Sci-Fun. My name is Sean Sterrett, and I am Sci-Fun. My name is Kyle McClee, and I am Sci-Fun. My name is Lindsay Aylesworth, and I am Sci-Fun. My name is Zen Falks, aka Dr. Zen, and I am Sci-Fun. My name is Dr. Rodney Roundtree, and I am Sci-Fun. My name is Amber Daniel, and I am Sci-Fun. I am Dr. Jennifer O'Leary, and I am Sci-Fun. I'm from Greece. I live in New Zealand. I am a PhD student in Sweden and my research is terribly cool. I'm from the United States. I am from Italy. I'm a biologist and blogger from Vancouver, British Columbia. Currently living in Australia. We're going to see space in Germany. I am from Mexico, so I am currently studying my PhD in the United States. I study a particular type of binary star system that undergoes gigantic and cataclysmic explosions. My research is super awesome and important because I'm looking at the effects of oral contraceptives on mangrove ecosystems. My research is important because it's helping land managers preserve the last remaining biodiversity on Kahoolawe, an uninhabited Hawaiian island that was used as a U.S. naval bombing range. And I study the lives of all female salamanders. These animals defy the way we traditionally think about the need for sex. Our research is cool because it isn't just science for the sake of science. It's about understanding how real people, like you and me, interact. My research is really cool because I get to work with pitcher plants, which are carnivorous, which means they eat bugs. My research is awesome because it's completely open and I publish it in real time. And my work is cool because I'm going to find out how birds cope with environmental unpredictability such as climate change. My research is super important because we're looking at the impact of chronic psychological stress on cell aging. My research is important because we're developing new and sustainable solutions to global health problems. And my research helps us understand how humans affect the oceans. I'm a population geneticist and my research attempts to trace the cause of people through their DNA. My research is cool because it links your genes with how you vote. I work with one of the most interesting, but probably most underestimated animals on the planet. It's actually a chicken. My research is important because redesigning the hospital gown may have far-reaching effects on patient engagement and the quality and safety of patient care. We are interested in studying how to better connect people like you to scientists like us. Yay, Saivon! Woohoo! So let's get started. And thanks for watching. <laughs>
And we also had a Google group, uh, which we have now in the current round as well, where people can email their thoughts back and forth. How's their proposal doing? What have they learned? Uh, what press releases have gone out? How can they help each other better fund their research? So it's really a, a community effort behind the scenes to get all of these projects funded, or as many as possible, to as high a level as possible. So that's how SciFund works. <clears throat> Once projects were posted, they all went up on Rocket Hub. And this is kind of what that looks like if you were to, to see a number of the, the proposals. Um, each individual proposal, as I said before, had a goal, uh, had some uh, target uh, goal, had a, a, an amount of time it ran. Everything ran for the same 45-day period. Um, had a proposal, had a video, had rewards. It, it was, uh, you know, full-blown crowdfunding proposals. Once SciFund was over, once we finished in December 15, we collected a number of pieces of data so we could look at what worked and to what extent was outreach and engagement a part of the SciFund challenge. So we had three main pieces of data. We had the server logs from Rocket Hub, so we actually had what individual pays, visits, and donations were like for each project. Um, we had public web statistics, so things like number of Facebook likes, number of YouTube hits, etc., uh, for each individual project. And we administered a survey of 80 different questions uh, to participants. This was in collaboration with Barbara Walker, one of our initial participants, who's a social scientist here at UCSB. So questions were, like, uh, were along the lines of things like, if you use Twitter, for how many months have you been using it? Or what method did you use to spread the word about your project? One to five, email, one to five, Facebook, etc. So we really tried to get a snapshot of what people had done. So here's kind of a, a summary of SciFund by the numbers, and then I'll go into the analysis of that data. Uh, we were covered by a lot of different news outlets, uh, both SciFund as a whole as well as individual projects. Outlets ranging from CNN to um, Forbes to MSNBC, and a lot of, a lot of blog coverage. It was, it was really great. We had a lot of good coverage, and that helped bring traffic. Uh, we raised $76,230, roughly, uh, from roughly uh, 1,200 individual donors. So a lot of people and a, and a good chunk of money, particularly for a lot of these uh, projects. Ten projects were fully funded, um, achieved their goal or more, and the average project pulled in about uh, $1,500. The maximum yield for a project, so kind of showing you where's the potential for this to go, at least in the short term, was $10,000. So it was possible, even in this first round, for someone to be able to bring in a large pool of funds to their project, <coughs> given the kinds of activities that they did. So here's a an overview of how things work. So here we have uh, the, the time series of SciFund, if you will. So we've got uh, time and dollars contributed. You can see there was an initial, a really fast increase in funds. People donated a lot early on, kind of leveled out, was sort of linear or even you know, never, never flattened out, which was nice. Uh, nice kind of linear increase for a while, and then it scooped right back up at the end. And that's actually fairly typical for a crowdfunding campaign. Um, this sort of quick start, linear, and then quick end. That's, that's fairly typical. Um, small donations really drove side funds. So here we have a histogram of the total amount raised, a uh, number of projects, as well as the, the donations. Most projects, as I said before, raised somewhere raised around $1,500. So we see that sort of um, range around $1,500, $2,000. That, that was really the sweet spot for projects in round one. And you can see that a lot of the donations were fairly small. The average donation was around $55. So actually, that's a good chunk of change. Um, but they ranged in that sort of $20 to $100 range, was the, the vast majority of donations. So small donations drove side fund. This kind of leads to the question of, all right, if we're starting to evaluate what led to the success of a proposal, to, to money coming into a proposal, um, are these small donations really driving the total amount raised by an individual project? Uh, or is it that, that long tail, those few donors that donate a lot of money, is that really what um, drove projects? Is it nice to get a lot of small donations, but you really need that big whopper? Is that really ultimately what's going to drive your success? Um, well, no, it, it really is number of donations. So here I've plotted the number of contributors to a project against the total dollars raised by that project. Um, each individual point is one project. And you can see there's a nice positive relationship between the two of them. Um, it explains a lot of the variation in our data, about 86% of the variation in our data, so a really good fit. I mean, sure, there's some wiggle around that, but man, that's a, that's a really nice relationship 
um, far tighter than I think I expected just looking at the number of contributions on their own. So it's all about getting contributors. More contributors, more funds. Crowdfunding, in a nutshell. Um, and there are kind of two roads to success. So the question is, if it's about contributors, what leads to the number of contributors? Um, so here's, here's kind of a, a slightly complicated graph, but it shows a couple of things going on all at once that drove the number of contributors. First, you can see I've plotted the number of contributors against the number of Facebook friends. We kind of hypothesize that this is a measure of your friends and family, that sort of local personal network. And there's a positive relationship there. And then we can look at just the number of times your project was looked at. In other words, the number of eyeballs in your project, how much traffic you were able to bring in. Um, and I've split that up into traffic before versus traffic after achieving success, and that's because uh, those projects that actually achieve success had something slightly different going on. Um, but what you can see first off is that larger points tend to fall above that line, so those larger points are projects that had more people looking at them. More people looking at them, more contributors. Second, you can see that projects that are more red uh, also have more are contributors. So that, that top one kind of, uh, that, that's really sort of our, our outlier, but it, it kind of shows the point that um, if you had a lot of people looking at your project after you achieved success, you also brought in more contributors. And in fact, we found that for those projects that were able to hit their goal, people became more likely to turn into uh, a contributor from viewing your project. So actually achieving success made people more willing to go from just eyeballing your project to actually clicking the donate button. So we have these two pathways, friends and family, which I've outlined, and then we have this just getting eyeballs and bringing in traffic, bringing in an audience. So let's break apart this audience pathway a little bit more. Um, what led people to come and look at projects? Well, one obvious way to, uh, one sort of obvious thing we looked at first off was how many people do you have in your larger network, in your larger professional public network? And uh, as with Amanda Palmer, with her half a million followers on Twitter, we thought, hey, Twitter, great way to measure a size of somebody's public network, of their audience. And indeed, you find a positive relationship between Twitter followers and the number of page views. You notice I've also included Facebook likes here. People went in and looked at your project and liked it and clicked that like button. That also led to more people coming into your project. So there's an element of quality. People really liked your work, but there's also an element of just bringing in an audience. And actually I'd argue that if you bring in an audience, they're more likely going to like your project as well. So audience, audience explains a lot. Again, 0.78, so 78% of the variations retained in this. Uh, pretty good explanatory power. So how do you create that fan base? How do you create that, that Twitter network? Um, the best metric that we felt that we had in our survey data was whether or not somebody is an active online science blogger. Uh, a lot of people participating in SciFund have been blogging, some people for up to a decade. Um, so we asked, okay, of those of you who are bloggers, what's your activity like? How often are you blogging per month? When we first looked at just do you have a blog versus don't you have a blog, but we wanted to drill down a little bit more. So uh, we looked at monthly blog posting frequency, how many posts do you put up on average per month, um, versus the number of Twitter followers. And again, you see there's a positive relationship. Um, it's not as strong in terms of explanatory power. There are other things going on there are other activities that people engage in that build their public fan base, their, their public network. Um, but creating regular content, definitely one of them. Doing that sort of outreach is definitely something that helps contribute to having that, that scientific fan base that can then go on and, and crowdfund your work. So I've shown you a bunch of different graphs and kind of told you when relationships are positive and negative. Um, I'd like to walk through these results uh, kind of piece by piece and assemble a picture for you so that you can see how engagement ultimately leads to funding a scientific project. Yes. So is that outlier the person who got more than 100%? Um, uh, no, actually it's not. It's our most, actually that's Zen. Um, okay. Then we had a couple of people who are, are really extraordinary online communicators who they've been blipping up here and there as outliers. We had one person who had 30,000 page views. She's someone who does a tremendous job at outreach. Um, she was such an outlier, we actually had to exclude her from a few analyses because nothing was close to her. So our results got all kinds of crazy. Um, but that's, yeah, that's, that's Zen, uh, who, who blogs at Neurodojo. Great, great science blog. All right, 
So the secret to Sci-Fun, um, it's engagement. And I want to show you how we can put that picture together. Um, and in fact, I meant to bring it. Anyone's interested in a take-home version of this slide, I've printed a couple of them out for you since there's a lot going on here. So if you want to look at this later, um, I'll grab those printouts once this is over. So first, we start with establishing an online presence. Uh, we found that one blog post per month led to, on average, about 53 followers. So every post you do per month, on average, will increase your public network size, your fan base, by about 53 people. Um, that scientific fan base translates to hits. So one Twitter follower translated almost directly to one page view of your project. It's a nice, almost near one-to-one -one relationship. Um, for every 110 project page views, you got one contributor. So 110 views and one person will finally click that donate button. Of course, I've mentioned there's also this friends and family pathway. Um, for every 50 Facebook friends you had, you had one contributor. So of course, your, your local, your, your friends and family network, they're going to be more likely to turn into contributions. The average contribution was around $55. Um, Project raise on average about 1,600, so in that in that range again. Um, and if you were able to do this successfully, meet your funding goal, you actually shifted the pattern of donations so that it only took 20 project page views to turn into one contributor. So you lowered that uh, quite significantly by by nearly an order of magnitude. So there's this feedback process. If you build up a large audience, and an audience sweeps in, funds your proposal, you're going to be even more likely to further fund your work. So really what I take from this is that you need to build that scientific fan base. You need to do the engagement and outreach work to build that fan base. It's not possible to be an overnight success in science crowdfunding. That there needs to be a built-in level of outreach, a built-in level of engagement, that brings people to look at your work. And then once they're there, you better have a good proposal that's going to hold their interest. So that's the sort of data-driven view. And I'd like to take a step back and kind of talk about the lessons and benefits of engaging via crowdfunding. So talk a little bit more about what was going on in that diagram, and then end on just a couple of final thoughts about engagement and outreach that we've taken away from um, going through sci-fun. Um, one, well, one and a half rounds now. So first off, we have that field of dreams model that some people went in thinking, well, I'll post my project, and if you build it, they will come. I mean, we literally had some people just post their project, and as far as I know, walk away. Um, that is not how this works. <laughs> um, the field of dream, crowdfunding is not a field of dreams. It's a field of a lot of hard work. <clears throat> Instead, this this fan base model, I mean, this is, this is a... Uh, Jai really loves to hammer on this, but this idea of every scientist, if they want to use crowdfunding for their work, they need to build a fan base. You need your thousand true fans uh, to come in and, and help you. That if you are able to build this fan base for your work, for your lab, um, that, that will, you will be able to leverage that into funds. Um, so, you know, the, the answer to the question, how can I crowdfund my science? There are a couple of things that you can do and a couple of things that we need to work collectively. Uh, towards in order to make crowdfunding a successful stream of revenue for science and to make it work for us. First, build an audience for your work. Establish a fan base. Um, try your hand at crowdfunding to start building an audience. I think that people that went through one round of this have now built up a donor network and they can keep those people engaged and interested in their work. Blog, tweet, Go to things like science cafes. Do what you can to establish a, a public science persona for yourself. Build that audience of people that are following you and are actively interested in the kinds of work that you do. Get trained. Um, the way I mean, these two kind of feed back on one another. The way to do the, the to build that audience is to do it well. And to do it well, most of us are going to need some training. Um, most of us are not natural easy outreach science communicators. It takes some work. It's a skill, and it's a great skill, um, both for, for doing this sort of work, but as well as, as then going on and actually working on your own science, just communicating in a journal. This is something that will benefit you at, at many stages throughout your career. Um, and last, work to change academic culture and policy. Um, I've kind of walked you through some examples from that, that one paper, but um, having outreach be uh, an equally valued part of our culture 
and of university policy, thinking about things like hiring and promotion practices or promoting collaborations with media and arts departments. That's a real way that you can um, <clears throat> create an incentive for both yourself as well as other scientists around you to go out and do this kind of outreach work. That you need to have an incentive to, to push some people kind of off that cliff and into the world of, all right, I have my science. It needs to get out of the ivory tower. You need to have those incentives. Um, but there are further benefits. So I've talked to you about this, this 1,000 true fans model that, that, that Jai actually really loves to push. Um, so there is this idea that if you, you do this, you create this audience, there's going to be a portion of your audience that is super engaged. And that's really where you're probably going to be tapping a, a, a lot of the people coming into crowdfunding research. But you also have this large tail, <clears throat> this large number of fans that don't necessarily contribute, but they're still impacted. They may not be funding your work, but these are people that are still impacted by what you're doing and the sorts of science that you're talking about. There are larger benefits to crowdfunding beyond just getting money for any one individual project. Um, by doing the sorts of engagement work that's required to build up an audience base to crowdfund your work, you're doing engagement work, you're doing outreach, you're building a bridge between science and society. You're, you're helping to enhance that science literacy by getting outside of your office. <clears throat> Thinking a little bit more selfishly, you're also creating an incubator for your projects. Let's say you have that crazy off-the-wall project that you need to do some pilot studies for. This is a way of, of funding that work, and not only funding it uh, to do it and get the preliminary data, but building a broader impact and outreach component to your work from the get-go, which is something that can then feed into, say, your NSF or NIH grant. So you're, you're getting preliminary data, you're building in broader impacts, uh, and you're bringing in some money and showing, yes, this, this work has legs not only as a scientific endeavor, but as something where it, you can build a, a broader impact to society. Um, crowdfunding also may provide a metric to assess your ability to connect. Uh, can you do it? Um, <laughs> metrics are a real problem. You know, I talked about trying to incorporate outreach and engagement into uh, practices, <clears throat> sorry, into um, university level decisions, into professional decisions, and we need metrics for that. This is one possibility of being able to measure, you know, how well can you do, how well is this, this sort of thing, uh, how are you doing at reaching out to a broader audience? Um, and, and sort of lastly, and, and this goes, I think, doubly so for uh, grad students and early career scientists, you can look at creating a crowdfunding proposal as funded outreach training. That you're going out, you're creating a video, you're creating broadly accessible text, you're thinking about your project in a much bigger and broader way, um, which I'd actually argue leads to you thinking about science in a bigger and broader way. But you're thinking about connecting to the public through this crowdfunding proposal, and in so doing, you're actually training yourself in outreach. You're, you're getting some training in, in going out and doing the work that you'll need to do, not just for a crowdfunding proposal, but for uh, any research project that you end up working on in the future. Um, so really, this is kind of the vision of, of crowdfunding for science and where it, it fits into the larger scheme. That by scientists, by reaching out with science, and the science message for its own sake can impact the broader public, which can then translate into research cash via crowdfunding, which allows scientists and, uh, to sort of feel much better and, and to it actually promotes scientists to do more outreach and training work. So there's this really nice feedback where outreach and engagement and feedback to lead into funding for your work. It's not all just about the funds, it's about the engagement. Um, and so with that, I'd like to thank uh, not only Jai, of course, but other collaborators on uh, putting this analysis together into its, its sort of final form and, and shaping the thoughts about it. So Barbara Walker's been huge as well as Zen. Um, and I'd really like to thank the, the 49 participants in round one. Uh, they were really brave to try this harebrained scheme. Um, it worked out pretty well, I think. So um, with that, um, I'll just remind you all that round two is ongoing. We're, we're just about to hit the 50% mark. Um, so far, we've raised about 65,000, so we're doing uh, really quite well. Uh, we have 75 scientists, so we've, not only, we've increased our number of scientists by about half. Uh, we're funding at a faster rate than we did before. Uh, there are a lot of proposals out there, and once we're finished with some Q&A afterwards, I'll bring up a couple of videos, some from people right here in this audience. Um, so you can take a look at them and go and look at some of their proposals online, and, and who knows, maybe donate. Or if you don't donate, at least send this out to your network of people, because getting the word out is what brings those donors in. 
All right, so thank you very much. So, <clears throat> so you're already hitting on a couple of great audiences, people that are interested in fire, what fire does in the world. You know, I, it's like, hey, you know, Jennifer Firestarter Ball. I mean, that's, there you go. Um, that's, that's huge. That, that's, that's one piece. You obvi have obvious interest in the Amazon, and there's a very, and, and conservation there, and there's a very large community of people interested in that. And to kind of create that, that, um, that presence for yourself as someone who is, is knowledgeable and putting out interesting, information about uh, work on Amazon conservation and fire. Uh, not even your own work, but just what's going on in that realm in general. That's another way to hook in that audience. Um, you know, I often, I think about the, the online science blog program there. There's some people that do tropical conservation stuff kind of pretty well, but I, I feel like that's definitely a niche that, that is a, a really good one to fill. Um, you know, every scientist has a niche, every scientist has a thing they do, and that's the people that they can tie into. It's a matter of, of getting that word out, of establishing establishing your ability to do that. And certainly with moving into sort of a, a, a sort of higher level academic position, you again, you sort of up your, your authority and you up your, your ability to say things and be listened to. Yeah. Uh, this was actually a challenge in, in putting together um, the, the paper that's growing out of this work. There's there's a good bit on increasing science literacy and literacy in K through 12. We're doing outreach activities, but beyond that, um, I haven't found a lot. Um, it's a really good idea, though, to think about. But we've we've been a little hesitant at contacting donors after the fact. Uh, we kind of thought about doing something along those lines in round one, but rejected it as being maybe a little a, stre a step too far. Um, but that's a really good idea. I mean, that for me, that's the sort of clearest way I can see is to actually contact people who are um, funding and say, "Hey, did you learn something? Did you?" I, I don't know what the survey instrument would be exactly, um, but that's probably the clearest way I can think about going about it. But we haven't. Um, yeah, we're thinking about what to do when round one is done, but we haven't. Yeah. Online and people could update yeah, yeah. No, that's a great idea. Um, unfortunately, right now we're we're limited by the fact that we don't run the, the platform. Um, that's a really good idea, though, for rent. Does Rocket Hub ever do that kind of thing? Like, I, I, don't I think know. I've gotten surveys from Kickstarter after uh -huh. donating. Yeah. No, I don't know. I, I may ask them about that. That would be a really great way to keep that collaboration going. And if not, something that we can, because we didn't think about it a priori, might be something that we can see about building into round three, um, which we're hoping will happen in the fall. Yeah. How did you actually do the training with uh, folks to do their videos, et cetera? Very informal. Uh, we put up a lot of, as much material as we could find on tutorials. Uh, we encouraged people, again, this is sort of the, that, that um, that community model. Uh, people that were experienced with it, we encouraged them to sort of share what they've been doing and, as pe and, and provided some resources for people to start. And then as people ran into issues and problems, again, the, the list was really key in communicating. Hey, I'm having this problem. Has anyone done this with iMovie before? Has anyone done that? And there was some really good dialogue on that, some back and forth. 
the great thing about putting together a community of this size is you're almost guaranteed to have a couple of people that are experts at one or two of those, those things. Um, this round, we've actually been very fortunate. We have somebody who used to write press releases for a living. Um, so she's been tremendous in helping people shape their messages uh, and getting that out. So we've, we've been doing the sort of informal training. You know, Jai's been trying to create more and more formal online tutorials and online um, training pieces. But it's uh, something that creating, shaping into the future is it's kind of one of our goals, trying to build in a much more formal training as Because we felt like that's been one of the real powerful pieces of, of, that's come from all of this. Yeah. Um, so from your Palmer model, you suggest that it takes some some big shots, some mm -hmm. some well-known names to really get the field as a whole over mm -hmm. some threshold. And it seems like from round one and, and to some extent round two, most of your participants have been grad students mm -hmm. or early career scientists. Yep. So, yep. Um, and it's I'm sure because people get more and more busy, mm -hmm. partly and partly just a generational gap. Yep. So how do you get those people? Over the, over the hump and get them to buy in. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I have two answers to that. Or do you need to? Yeah, I mean, the first and, and most obvious thing to me, anyway, is that this is a long term investment. Um, and that by starting this now, by starting early career scientists doing this now, uh, then they'll build this in, hopefully, into a part of who they are as a scientist. Right, and it gets easier and easier. Right, it gets easier and easier. They have better experience. They train their own students. Um, we actually have one person who was more senior and worked with her lab to get the word out um, and to try a lot of different media. And that ended up leading to um, successful funding for her. Um, so there's the long-term perspective. Um, in the short term, how do you get people who are at that, that level? Um, you know, one, one hope that I have is certainly that as we get the word out that this exists, that it works, and these are the things you need to do, that that will become an attractive option for people in those, those, um, those places. I've actually been really encouraged looking at Petri Dish. Petri Dish has been getting more and more senior researchers in uh, to try and crowdfund their work. Petri Dish has a, a, a different model, uh, and, out, and they, they actually actively collaborate on doing outreach. Uh, they're, they're, an, they're an interesting company. Um, but they've been able to leverage much more senior researchers into bringing larger pools of funds. I've seen a, a number of projects go through there at ten to twenty thousand dollar level and get funded. So that kind of gives me again that sort of faith that like, well, hey, they're, they're bringing in these, these bigger names, these people that already have those established networks, and they've been able to make it work as well. So I think both it's kind of a both both of those are are ways that we'll go in the future to try and get them. I was just curious, you know, when at interviewing when interviewing for jobs in the fall, did you talk about Siphon and did you focus? on it at all as part of like, or did you? Like, yeah, it was actually the, uh, I think we're in the, yeah, it was the last slide of my seminars actually, it's the last slide of my job talks. I'm basically showing like, not only have I done all of this work as a scientist, but I'm really interested in giving that work to a larger audience and fostering a change in culture where we all do that. Um, I found that there are a lot of people, a lot of the grad students were really interested in it, particularly given that the pools of funding were perfect for grad student summer research support. So people got very interested in it for that. Um, some of the faculty had different opinions, but everyone seemed to be like, well, that's great. Um, interestingly, the most positive responses I got were from deans. Um, the deans I talked to thought this was really cool. Um, which is funny, because we've, we've had some institutional pushback on this. Um, there have been departments, particularly development offices and um, and funding offices of funding in different universities, aren't really sure how to deal with crowdfunding yet. Some have been great here at UCSB. It's been it's been like a dream. They've really helped us figure out how to make this work. Other institutions, um, yeah, I won't name any names. But other institutions have actually said, take our name off of anything that you put up. Um, so it, it seems to vary a lot by institution. But the, the teams that I talked to when I interviewed were like, this is great. This gets our university's name out there. You're doing this outreach. This is, this is fantastic. Uh, which for me was really kind of a wake up. Like, wow, if, if at this level people are, are that interested in it, this is, this is clearly something that um, can be changed in terms of policy. Yeah, is there anything structural in how this is set up to insulate it from somebody? Oh, I don't know, maybe, maybe you want to try this as an experiment, but the idea that somebody would do something cynical mm -hmm. and just 
potentially destructive as a test of sort of the democratization and freedom of speech issues. Mm -hmm. If I'm one of the Koch brothers and I want to make this look bad, I'll have a page that says, I'm going to do all the research you need to say that smoking is good for you or whatever. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so at this point, we do have a, a kind of light uh, peer review process before we accept proposals. So we basically do a fraud check. Um, we had someone propose rewriting the rules of gravity. Right. Mm -hmm. That's really a bummer. Or um, <laughs> okay, but there's a lot of gray between that. And there is a lot of gray. Yeah, there there's a lot of gray. Um, <clears throat> and maybe that, you know, if the Koch brothers, if, if something like that were to sneak through, um, somehow make it past that filter and actually get out there, then yeah, it is up to the crowd. Um, there have been a couple of science projects on Rocket Hub that, uh, I the name of it, something like how to invent a tranquilizer for dinosaurs um, that they posted. Um, Rocket Hub doesn't have the, the same review process as some other sites. Um, they were like, yeah, we'll let the crowd decide. They're very much a we'll let the crowd decide operation. Um, although they actually, even though, even they have a fraud check and approval process. So, uh, uh, yeah, so they, they tried that and uh, didn't get funded. Had like 3%, which I think was just the investigators funding themselves to see if they could give it some momentum. Um, there's another project up there right now, science, that again, you look at, it doesn't pass the smell test. No funding. Yeah, I guess there's there's sort of the absurd things, mm -hmm. which we can all sort of chuckle about, but um, I suspect that there are some things that are perhaps more sinister that have the opportunity to damage the credibility of all the other stuff that's attached to the whole process. Mm -hmm. And it's the kind of thing that comes up with commenting on YouTube videos and commenting on blogs and, and all this other stuff. And it's the, it, the risk of democratizing mm -hmm. what has been a guild-like process. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering if, if that's a discussion ongoing or if this is just it is an ongoing see what discussion. happens. Yeah, no, and it's not just it's not just science, it's all of crowdfunding. So with with things like uh, Amanda Palmer's success and, and a couple of other recently Pebble and a few of the uh, other recently covered stories, there's been a real um, there's been a, a series of articles kind of asking can crowdfunding be gamed and this sort of democratized system be gamed and people will be defrauded. Um, <clears throat> And the answer is obviously, yeah. If someone was sufficiently smart and sinister and worked the system, yes. Um, but you know, there's no system that can avoid that entirely. If someone's sufficiently smart and sinister to get some of that passed here, they can get it. You know, it's the same question. I mean, you're really revisiting the same question of something like archive and open access publishing, right? Same thing. Sure, the Koch brothers can put something on the archive. But the question is, what's the long term? By having the Koch brothers put something on archive, does that devalue everything on the archive? Or is there a process by which ultimately it's thrown out? Um, same thing here. Sure, you might have some weird, strange, sinister project get funded, but then at the end that project doesn't turn out anything, doesn't engage its audience, doesn't go forward, well then that project in the long term is lost while all of these other projects go forward with their audiences, with the research that they produce, um, and, and keeping this, this whole process going. So, I, yeah, I see it as very similar to the open access discussion and, and the sort of same um, community level safeguards are there in the end. Yeah, well, it was the, the same problem, the sort of, well, Origin of Life has that problem big time. I was at a NASA conference and they videotaped the sessions. One guy who's an industrial chemist gave one of the videotape talks about sort of experimenting with the origin of life by killing a lot of bacteria and then like maybe heating them so that they would come back to life. <laughs> I don't expect that talk's going to be publicized. But it looks like science, if we do the best we can, it's sort of nice looking abstract. Yeah. But when he got up and talked. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, related to that is what's to prevent somebody from taking those funds and buying a car for themselves? Mm -hmm. Is there any accountability after that? So the nice thing about um, science crowdfunding is that most of these scientists are associated with universities or research institutions. Um, <clears throat> for tax purposes, it actually behooves them to have that money channeled directly to the university or institution with which they're a part. So if I'm crowdfunding and uh, come to the end of the campaign, Rocket Hub just cuts me a check. 
but if they cut me a check and I take it, that's income for me and I get taxed on it. On the other hand, if at the end of it you say, okay, Rock Club, send my check to UCSB, um, UCSB takes the check, there are no tax implications for me, and then UCSB is overseeing that as standard research funds. Uh, so that leads to accountability. So you're right, it is entirely possible at the end of the day that someone can say, you know what, I'm just going to take this money and run. Um, again, I'd argue you can do that once, but after the first time, who's going to crowdfund your research if you've shown no actual product from the first time around? You have to build a proven record of success. Jared, just related to that, um, what's the percentage of ones that actually get funded in terms of the last round? And also related to that question that we just had, is UCSB or any other university going to take an overhead on that, or is it treated as a gift? Good so question. Is. Um, so the the numbers escaped me with percentages in the last round. Um, it was, I think, around 15 or 20 percent. Uh, we're hoping for a higher percentage this time around. Um, in fact, I think our, our total percent funding, if you look at all the projects as a whole, is already we hit 40 percent yesterday. So 40 percent of everything that's been asked for has been funded so far. Um, and we're just reaching our halfway point. So, you know, not, not 50, but pretty good. Um, <clears throat> in terms of overhead, that's a really interesting question. I think that's something that will come up if this becomes a, a serious source of funds. Currently, uh, these things, uh, crowdfund, the funds from, from Rocket Hub do go in as a gift. Uh, and I think this time around, again, it varies by institution. At UCSB, it was 8 or 9%. So not the 50% overhead. So if you're raised, you know, 50% overhead on a $2,000 grant, it's obviously not going to work. Um, as pools of funding get larger and larger, I would guess that that question will be revisited. So if you are going in for a million dollar crowdfunded project, we've reached that point we've won, basically. Um, so I, I don't know that some of the universities will have to, ah, great, yes. Anyone who's interested in that diagram from before, it's up here now. Um, so I think we'll have to revisit that in the future. Can you pass through the tax deductibility to donors? Uh, at this point, because we're not a 501c3, we cannot. Um, we've actually been working with one of the, the projects that is associated with a 501c3, and they're trying to figure out how to make that work. Rocket Hub does regularly partner with organizations like that, um, so it's possible, um, but that's, that's something that we're going to be working on for the future. So it, it, it's definitely possible, just not there yet. I was wondering, so um, you've shown us the guidelines for how to make grants, but you was not affiliated to anyone, and so it seems a little unfair that he has a disadvantage that he doesn't have an institution uh, of reference for his work. And it said it seems like this is a nice opportunity exactly for those kind of more independent projects. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if that can be balanced out by the fact that maybe Siphon gets um, a reputation for having a good selection process, even if it's not a strict process, it still remains, as you say, light, but mm -hmm. then there's maybe an advantage to that mm -hmm. and to build that kind of trust. And I was wondering if, if that can also be done by keeping a record of mm -hmm. who actually proves that they've actually gone and done the work. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm going to be really curious to see what happens when people go back to the well for a second time. I think that's going to establish, uh, really show whether or not crowdfunding is working um, and how it, it, it works in, in building an audience. Um, but I think you're right. I think in particular for people that are independent researchers to some extent, it's a great way to fund their work. Um, someone that's currently between career stages, between career positions, um, for whatever reason is, is independent. This is, is certainly one means of funding. If there's someone that can um, have that established track record, it's something they can do to, to fund their work. Jared, are you, are you at a disadvantage in ecology? I mean, it, it strikes me that research mm -hmm. or, or the music mm -hmm. or products, people usually invest in their small bit mm -hmm. and because they feel like they're getting something that mm -hmm. mm -hmm. they'll get a discount on the product when it's created that they're, they're, they're connected to somebody who has cancer mm -hmm. so they're helping. Uh, how, do you think that, I mean, are you going to be able to scale it up to that mm -hmm. Without you know an album that I will get right. when it's produced. Yeah, I'm I'm really not sure. Um, 
on the one hand, uh, you know, on the one hand, people are doing things like putting up that information. So again, for ecology, for example, you have real-world applications. For any of these projects that actually have applications that capture people's imagination, um, I see it as, as very akin to other forms of charity. Um, hopefully. Uh, on the other hand, you do have things like building in those rewards, building in those those gift bags that allow people to become engaged. Um, like I said in the, early on in the talk, someone once described this as like, well, crowdfunding, it's like a giant t-shirt sale. Um, and in fact, there was a project at Bell Diaries which just created these gorgeous, beautiful artistic shirts. And that's really what sold the project to some extent. So there's that element of creating a product, creating something that creates uh, a connection between you and the project, but then also is giving something back to your donors. Um, but you're right, I feel like if people are just tossing their money into a void, then ultimately that's not, that's not gonna work out. And that's, that's another reason that building that audience for the science work that you do is so critical. Um, because then people feel like they're supporting work from someone they know, from someone whose information they trust. And it's kind of, Jaya likes to pitch it as the NPR model. When NPR fundraising rolls around, um, you're not funding them because they're asking you for funds. You're funding them because you listen to them throughout the entire year. It's part of your daily commute. Yeah, can I just throw this out? I don't know. This is just an idea. But maybe it also creates some sort of accountability for scientists to like actually get their work done. Mm -hmm. As a scientist, we should apparently struggle with it. Yeah. yeah. Something's done. And, and I'm kind of serious about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah that's actually what I was referring to before was not thinking about how many returned for the second time, mm -hmm. but how many document that they've spent that money, yep. how they spent the next time that they started. Yeah, there's, there's definitely accountability. But I, think going, I, don't know, I think you just document that going back the second time. Here's what I did last time. Yeah. Here are the things that I spent on, and here's what it turned out. Here's a paper. But I think if you have a, so when you have your site on records, have a way to uh, store mm -hmm. that information or allow people to access it, that, Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. Great, well with that